Somewhere deep in the big cypress of southwest Florida, a renewal of life. A kitten, curious, cuddly, imperfect. Will she survive to cavort through the palmetto hammocks? Or will life be cut short by disease, a car on a highway, or another cat? Will she mature into a loving mother, or be unable to reproduce, or even to find a suitable mate? And in her declining years, will she become the Grizabella of the musical cats, the last of a great clan pouring out a lonely lament? Memory, all alone in the moonlight. I can smile at the old days. I was beautiful then. I remember a time I knew what happiness was. Let the memory live again. This is the story of the majestic but elusive Florida panther the official mammal of the Sunshine State, and the effort to ensure the big cat remains more than just a memory. In recent years, America has been having a love affair with cats. They've replaced dogs as the most popular domestic animals. In zoos and circuses, big cats are among the most popular attractions. So why hasn't the king of our own jungle been placed on a pedestal alongside the lion and tiger and other big cats? Is the panther making its last stand in Florida? Are the remaining cats healthy and genetically viable? Why are there so few animals remaining? Can the panther make a comeback? Do true Florida panthers still exist? What's being done to help them? We're going to try to provide some answers. However, some of the questions have many answers, some none at all. The Florida panther is one of 28 subspecies of the cougar, which has also been called a mountain lion, puma, or catamount. Now, if you put a cougar and a panther side by side, it's difficult to tell the difference, and even the scientists who study these animals will frequently refer to mountain lions or cougars when they're really talking about panthers. The panther's body is about the same size as the cougar, but the color may be a bit darker. The panther has shorter, coarser hair, longer legs, and smaller feet. Among humans, identical twins often look very much alike at first glance, but a closer look reveals little differences in physical appearance. It's kind of like that with panthers and cougars. Such differences have usually evolved as a subspecies is adapted to a particular environment or habitat. The panther once roamed all across the southeastern United States. Most experts say the only remaining panthers are now in southern Florida. The largest population is in the region of the Big Cypress in the Fakahatchee Strand, state or federally protected lands, and the private corkscrew swamp. Those cats also range out into other public and private lands, especially in the direction of Lake Okeechobee. Individual males with radio collars have been tracked east almost to Fort Lauderdale and north to the Caloosahatchee River, but they've always returned to home ground. A smaller population, perhaps six to eight animals, lives to the southeast in Everglades National Park. They sometimes wander into the Big Cypress region as their northern neighbors sometimes wander south to the Everglades. So their paths do cross. The Everglades cats have been known to wander into the groves and farms of the East Everglades, and one female was tracked as far east as Homestead Air Force Base on the coast. Between the two groups, wildlife biologists confirmed in mid-1991 the existence of about 70 panthers. There could be a few more. Are these cats the real thing? Some have claimed there hasn't been a true Florida panther in the wild for years, that today's cats are a mix of panther and cougars released by collectors and private owners. Uh, anything out here is a Florida panther as far as I'm concerned. Now, the, the problem with that argument is the only way to really uh, answer that would be to uh, build a time machine and go back uh, to the 40s and 50s and, and compare uh, the, the genetics of those animals with what we have today. And uh, I don't think that technology is forthcoming for time travel, so that answer probably will never be satisfactorily answered. I think what we need to do is make the best of the situation and, and proceed ahead with, with what uh, we have and what we consider the, the state mammal. Florida panther as a subspecies doesn't matter anymore. There is no pure animal. It's diluted, diluted or changed by where they live and the release of captive animals. Now, there's over a thousand people in the state of Florida licensed to have cougars, which is a Florida panther. And some of them are turned loose, get loose, deliberately one way or another, and they will breed with anything we have here. We've proven through DNA tests that some of the cats in Florida have South American blood. 
it matters to me as a scientist. Um, it matters to a lot of people because they, they view it as the Florida panther as the Florida panther. And, uh, you know, if we were to bring animals in from elsewhere and just turn them loose, it would not be the same animal. It would be very, very, very closely related. But, uh, but uh, you know, it, there is a difference there. So if we, can, uh, if we can maintain the panther in Florida without foregoing its genetic differences, uh, that would be the best thing that we could do. And, and the point is that we think we can. Uh, there are records in Everglades National Park of animals having been released. Uh, the assumption when those animals were released was that those were true Florida panthers. So um, that's the assumption I go on. These are true Florida panthers. The uh, Florida panther is one of 28 different subspecies of the North American and Central and South American cougar. And I think it's important because it's a unique type, but can't lose sight that it is a subspecies. But it's very specialized for the uh, habitat of Florida. It has different morphological characteristics, especially the dark uh, coloration, the smaller feet, and the different skull uh, characteristics. So it is definitely a unique type. And to, to what extent we go to say this unique type is, I think, a decision made, needs to be made by a lot of different people. So most experts agree there is a Florida panther. Scientifically, Felis concolor corii. They also agree that action is needed to not only keep these cats in Florida, but to expand their numbers, preserve their habitat, and prevent genetic deterioration. More on that later. Nearly 150 years ago, James Audubon painted the western cougar, close relative of the panther. In later years, artists turned brushes and cameras occasionally to the panther, and for most Floridians, that's as close as they've ever gotten. Few people have ever encountered them in the wild. Panthers are rarely ever seen in a zoo. Many hunters who have spent years slogging through the Big Cypress and Everglades regions say they've never seen one and wonder what all the panther fuss is all about. Some of them could have passed within a few feet of a panther and never known it. Well, the animals are very secretive. Uh, they're primarily nocturnal. Uh, the areas they select to spend the day in uh, to sleep and rest are, are generally so rough and remote uh, that the likelihood of, of a person encountering a panther is, is, is pretty slim. Uh, they will get out into open areas, uh, but that usually happens at night when people aren't about. And uh, uh, they're so, they're, their senses are so keen that uh, you may be a half mile away and they know you're there. Uh, so even with this technology, we may know where the panther is, but that's not even a guarantee for us to approach them to the point that we can see them. To illustrate, somewhere in this scene, a Florida panther is concealed. Can you spot him? There he is, watching, and you would have walked right past no more than 30 feet away. Perhaps that's been part of the panther's problem. Down there in all that vast acreage, out of sight, out of mind. It's hard to glorify what you can't see. Many feel the panther is making its last stand in southwest Florida, and even there, Panther habitat is being lost as homes and shopping centers creep ever eastward, eliminating more and more wilderness, further constricting the range of the great cats. And citrus growers seeking to escape winter freezes in central Florida are now moving well south of Lake Okeechobee, converting more wild lands, adding to the isolation of the panther. It may have been the loss of habitat and hunting which eliminated the panther from the rest of Florida and the south. Unlike some western states, hunting of panthers has been banned in Florida since the 1950s. The panther got more attention when it was added to the federal endangered species list in 1973. While there have been some writings about panthers through the years, serious research in Florida didn't get started until 1981. Until that time, much of what we know about panthers came from observing cats in captivity. A visit to Frank Weed's place at the edge of the Big Cypress near Immokalee can be helpful in observing some types of behavior. His cats are cougars. He's bred and raised about 200 and usually has about a dozen of them around. When we visited, Frank and his wife Ellen were bottle feeding a two-week-old and keeping watch over a two-month-old cub who was just starting to explore the property. Frank has a natural area which many still photographers and film and video cameramen have used to get shots of the cougars. The cats often wind up being identified as Florida panthers. 
and the resemblance and behavior are close enough that nobody raises much of a fuss. Two of Frank's cats are each about a year old and often hard to handle. They're playful, rambunctious, and sometimes dangerous. Since they've been raised by humans, they're reasonably tame, but they are large and powerful, and a playful leap can flatten a man and leave him bloodied from tooth marks. Frank got a gash on his cheek when he was accidentally hit by one of those long canine teeth. Anyone who has domestic cats will recognize some similar behavior in cougars or panthers. A domestic exhibits predatory behavior in stalking a lizard or a piece of string. Big cats operate in much the same manner, with a sudden pounce that's hard for prey to evade. A domestic cat will often, for no apparent reason, suddenly race through the house or yard as though crazed. Frank's cougars do the same thing, racing through the woods and brush. One spent several minutes leaping eight to ten feet off the ground, trying to pull down the branches of a tree. One thing we noticed about cougars, they don't have a great deal of endurance. After a burst of activity, they need a rest. Panthers in the wild exhibit the same lack of endurance, meaning they have to make quick kills of prey for food because they can't chase a deer over a long distance. Here's something else that may look familiar. Morris, a 12-year-old male, eating grass, just as domestic cats do, and apparently for the same reason. In a couple of minutes, Morris purges his stomach of pieces of bone and other undigested matter. Incidentally, Frank's cats are usually fed chicken. In the wild, though, the panther's prey of choice is deer, which, because of its size, can provide a week's worth of meals. Panthers will also kill and eat wild hogs and turkeys, but they won't hesitate to eat raccoon, possum, and other small birds and animals, and one panther in Everglades Park frequently kills and eats small alligators. Observing cats like Frank's is, of course, interesting, but it doesn't come close to providing the kind of scientific information needed by wildlife biologists, the kind of data that can only be gathered in the wild. That's where radio telemetry comes in. State researchers, headed by the Game and Freshwater Fish Commission's Dave Mayer, have tracked more than 35 panthers since 1981. Usually there are 12 to 15 panthers wearing radio collars at any given time. The collars transmit signals that can be followed from the air or ground. Even though Mayer rarely sees a cat from the air, the signal tells him where it roams, when mating takes place if both cats are wearing collars, when a female might be making a den for giving birth, and when two males fight over territory. The collars emit a different signal if a panther stops moving for a certain period of time, a feature that has proven to be a lifesaver, as Mayor explained. This particular collar was worn by uh, male panther number 12, uh, an old resident male, very dominant animal, has uh, sired many litters, and uh, his collar started malfunctioning uh, one uh, November, and eventually within a month it, it uh, went out. And uh, upon his recapture, we were very lucky to recapture him. Uh, since they have home ranges that, that sometimes exceed three or four hundred square miles, uh, we were able to examine the collar and find out what happened. And uh, when you uh, look at it closely, not only is there a hole here, but there's also a dent over on that side. And if you take a, a skull of a panther and actually uh, match it up with the hole, uh, it, it, it matches quite nicely. One canine penetrated uh, the canister, the other just dented uh, the other side. So. Uh, a couple things happened as a result of this fight with another panther. Uh, this transmitter went out, but it also probably saved number 12's life. And the attacking cat, or the, uh, the one that actually got the worst of the end of the deal, died as a result of some infections uh, due to some scratches and, and bites. Mayor's federal counterpart in Everglades National Park is Orrin Sunny Bass. With a smaller population, his weekly tracking efforts involved no more than three or four collared panthers. A recent signal that a cat had stopped moving brought bad news, and we could tell Bass had a certain affection for the animal that was found dead, apparently of natural causes. She was the prime uh, reproductive female for the area. She was the matriarch of the population here. And, uh, you know, the question about her loss, because this is a small population that you're dealing with anyway, anytime you lose a uh, reproductively active female like that, uh, that's a substantial loss to a population. Bass and Mare would love to be able to get close to panthers in the wild, to observe mating, denning, and other activities. Since there's no way a panther will stick around for such a human intrusion, the radio collar remains a primary research tool. 
The only times these biologists get close to their subjects is when it's time to put on new collars, with fresh batteries about every two years. And it's no small operation. In the Big Cypress region, Mayor takes a team of at least a half dozen people to assist in the capture and the scientific and medical work that takes place. Once the panther is located by radio signal, specially trained dogs are sent into the area. The panther flees, but because of its lack of endurance, will usually head up a tree within a few minutes. Except for emergency cases, captures are made only in the cooler months of the year to reduce some of the stress on the animal. Once treed, tranquilizer darts are used to subdue the panther. More often than not, the cat remains in the tree after the drug has taken effect. That means someone has to climb the tree, attach a line, and lower the animal to the ground. A dangerous job if the panther has some fight left. What happens in the next 30 minutes to an hour goes far beyond the mere changing of a collar, for this represents another major area of panther research. We uh, generate a battery of, of measurements from uh, pad width and length, foot pad width and length, tail length, body length, uh, girth, uh, weight, uh, canine uh, length, uh, 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 a whole bank of uh, biological samples from hair to uh, stool to blood uh, to urine, uh, just about everything we can, we can get our, our hands on and into a test tube or into a little swirl pack. Um, and those measurements are important for looking at growth patterns, uh, comparing uh, uh, the sizes of animals from one part of its range to another, uh, looking at uh, health parameters from one area to another, and within in individuals, looking out at how those animals' uh, health has changed as they've gotten older, and how they may have uh, uh, changed their movements from one area to another. Uh, so they're, they're all very important uh, uh, parts of the program. Vaccination? They receive vaccinations, uh, uh, samples taken for genetic testing, for mercury sampling, a uh, battery of diseases can be looked for and, and vaccinated against. In addition to all the testing and sampling, panthers can be treated for minor wounds. Those with injuries that can't be treated in the field will be taken to Miami's Metro Zoo or another facility. In past years, a panther with a badly healed foot from an old gunshot wound and one that was injured in a collision with a truck underwent surgery at Metro Zoo and were returned to the wild after recovery. All of this research, however, cannot fill in the blanks of the past. We tend to assume that because there is a limited number of panthers in southern Florida now, they are nearing extinction. How many were there 40 years ago? 100 years ago? It's possible that when bounties were paid for panthers and their chief food source, deer, were nearly wiped out in an effort to stamp out the disease, the panther population was far lower than it is now. Six to eight panthers in an area as huge as the Everglades seems like an incredibly small number. Is it? You have a mouse population that's 30 or 50 that you're trying to save, which normally numbers, you know, orders of magnitude higher than that. And you're dealing with a mountain lion population or a panther population here, where you're dealing with 30 to 50 in an area like this. Most mountain lion biologists would look at that and go, well, 30 or 50 in an area this size, well, that's probably comparable to what we've got in the West. The thing is, it's the last remaining population in eastern United States, east of the Mississippi River, documented. It's in eastern North America, most developed area in North America. Uh, you know, for all the reasons that they're endangered, because they were persecuted when white man came, they destroyed all their habitat. Um, now this animal only occurs in what's left. And so, yeah, there's some concern. Dave Mayer says that in the past five or six years, the panther population in the Big Cypress region has been stable, that births have exceeded deaths which is not to say that he and others don't have concerns about the panther's future. The loss of habitat, which has isolated panthers in the Big Cypress and Everglades, has led to considerable inbreeding. Writing in the Miami Herald in 1990, Peter Gallagher, president of Save the Florida Panther, said, inbreeding will doom the cat in 25 to 40 years. Mating of mothers and sons, brothers and sisters, can eventually result in incredible genetic loss. The products of inbreeding might be deformed, sterile, have non-functioning immune systems. Some say it's happening already. The men in the field, though, don't fully agree. And I'm sure there are probably cases out there where these animals have, you know, succumbed, went under. But there are other cases, too, where these animals have gone through these, quote, genetic bottlenecks, and, and they're still with us. Now, how much longer they'll be with us? I, I would question whether these animals are going to go under in 25 to 40 years. 
And the reason I would question that they would go under in 25 or 40 years is because what you're seeing now is probably the way it's been for the last 25 or 40 or 100 years. Despite the fact that there is a very high deformity rate in sperm, uh, females appear to get pregnant uh, whenever they're capable of getting pregnant. Uh, so we, I don't think we've measured uh, a response to inbreeding as far as reproduction goes, uh, nor as far as behavior goes or any measurable uh, behavioral type responses to uh, to the inbreeding phenomenon. Uh, it certainly is something that that we need to be concerned about and uh, and, and keep our finger on the pulse as, as time goes by. A group of panther kittens may hold the answer to the problem of inbreeding and the lack of panther populations elsewhere in Florida. In the spring of 1991 this kitten and five others about the same age were removed from the Big Cypress. The tracking and capture procedures were the same as those used in getting other cats for testing and collar changing. These cats were sent far from home to be part of a grand experiment called captive breeding. Captive breeding has two uh, ultimate objectives for us. One, of course, the immediate objective is to increase numbers in captivity and be able to achieve some genetic and physiological objectives in the captive animals. But the purpose of those animals, once we have uh, animals produced that we want to use elsewhere, would be for placement back in the existing wild population. The kittens are now in residence at White Oak Plantation north of Jacksonville. It's a private facility with a track record in captive breeding of other species. The kittens, which will be the backbone of the captive breeding program, are isolated rarely seeing humans, and constantly monitored by closed-circuit television. Their mating efforts will be carefully controlled. We have uh, two sets of litter mates, a male and a female, and two brothers, and then two females unrelated. So we have the combination to have three unrelated pairs of animals, and that was the goal, to have these three unrelated pairs. So, But they, the best thing is to have the siblings because they know each other, and they're still young now. They're nine or ten months of age. They need each other. They're not a solitary animal until they actually become 18 to 20 months of age. So right now they have a social need either for their mother or for the sibling. So we felt that having a sibling or another animal of the same age, like one uh, pairing is two females from different litters, uh, that they uh, get along fine, they interact with each other, they need each other, and that's, that's important, I think, to raising a well-balanced animal for, for being productive in captivity. The other thing in captivity, you can arrange the matings to maximize your genetic uh, variability of the population. You can avoid inbreeding, you can arrange things. In the wild, this doesn't occur. You have fathers breeding daughters, grandfathers breeding granddaughters, things of this nature, which all are a detriment to the health of the population. So in captivity, we can arrange things so that the animals produced will be the best genetic uh, mix for the population. And then these animals can be put out back in the wild in South Florida, and hopefully into new areas in North Florida or South Georgia. Should they experiment using just the Florida panther stock and counter genetic problems, Texas cougars could be brought into the mix in order to produce animals more likely to survive. Two other panthers may play an important role in the White Oak program. This is Big Guy, whose leg was shattered in a collision with a vehicle. Surgically repaired, he now lives in a 15-acre enclosure at White Oak. He has mated with cougars, but produced no offspring. His sperm, however, will be used in experiments in artificial insemination and in vitro fertilization. He could become a daddy yet. And this young female, raised by John Lucas, will be part of the same experimental program. She may be tame, but her offspring would be wild if isolated from human contact. From these initial steps, it is hoped that captive breeding stocks will be developed, eventually leading to regular releases of animals. State officials plan to target several areas where panthers will either be reintroduced or used to bolster existing populations. The Osceola National Forest and adjoining Okefenokee Swamp section is one area where panthers haven't been seen for years. The Panhandle's Apalachicola Forest is another. In South Florida, the Everglades region ranks high, and Sunny Bass would like to have more cats to deal with. I think there are areas within National Park Service lands, which includes Everglades National Park and Big Cypress National Preserve, where panthers could be reintroduced. And uh, now whether the animals stay here or not is something that no one will know until you try it.
I mean, there's good indication that they will. Um, I believe because of the habitat that's available to them that uh, they will settle in. Now, they may not settle in exactly where you want them to. They'll choose their own spot. But, um, yeah, I think you can successfully reintroduce them into the park. Dave Mayer also supports captive breeding, but says it needs to be tied in with efforts to prevent further habitat loss. The largest expense by far has been incurred in converting the two-lane Alligator Alley to a four-lane section of Interstate 75. Not only have miles of 10-foot high fence been installed, but more than 30 underpasses were built at a cost of a million dollars each. But that's not solely for the benefit of panthers. It's unfortunate sometimes that we only focus on panthers when it comes to the underpasses because while panthers do use them and it certainly has uh, reduced the likelihood of, of mortality from, uh, from automobile strife, uh, those underpasses have also allowed so several other things to happen. It's permitted a more natural drainage flow from the north to the south and uh, the hazard of, of an automobile striking uh, a large heavy object like a deer or a bear or a panther has been eliminated and, and the highway is much safer for people as well. And Tom Logan makes a very similar point in answering those who criticize the cost of saving a few cats. Panther habitat is also people habitat. It's panther habitat in those vast, natural, very diverse areas of South Florida. That's where freshwater recharge occurs. That uh, produces the water that people in Naples and Miami and Lauderdale drink and cook with. Uh, it's also the plant community that produces the clean air, the oxygen, that's absolutely essential to human life in South Florida. So the bottom line is that panther recovery will only be achieved at the same time that we preserve man's quality of life in South Florida. So maybe, just maybe, the plight of the Florida panther isn't quite as desperate as we've been led to believe. Not yet, anyway. And if the combination of science and enlightened land management pay off, panthers will be out there in the wilderness for decades to come, and we'll all be better off.